Hey guys, we're now outside a demolished home. I'm going to talk about this home in just one moment, but before I do that, I want to just talk you through house demolitions in general. So, there are three types of house demolitions. Punitive, military, and administrative. Punitive demolitions basically means demolitions carried out as a punishment, which is actually a leftover from the British mandate, where they used to demolish the homes of Zionist militias uh, for doing attacks on the British. And they've carried it on, and so they punish Palestinians for attacks on Israelis. The punitive house demolitions are a form of collective punishment. And that's punitive house demolitions. And that's punitive house demolitions. In 2005, the Israeli government decided to suspend punitive house demolitions because, and I quote, they said, it only inflames the people and rather than deterring attacks, actually encourages them. In 2014, the summer of 2014, only a few months ago, the Israeli government decided to reinstate punitive house demolitions, fully aware of the fact that it only inflames the people and rather than deterring attacks, actually encourages them. The second type of house demolitions are military demolitions. So these are demolitions carried out for any military purpose, either for land clearance, for military infrastructure, or again as, pu as, as... So Israel has a policy of extrajudicial executions, where they will kill people outside of the, the, the court, sort of outside of, of taking them to court. Um, so for example, during the summer, during the attack on Gaza, they demolished the home of the head of Hamas's military wing, in fact only killing his family and kids, he wasn't even in the house. But that's an example of a military demolition. Another example of a military demolition is in the South Hebron Hills. In the South Hebron Hills, there's an area that back in the 1980s was declared a firing zone. It's called Firing Zone 918. Within that firing zone, there are five Palestinian villages. What's the Israel solution? Demolish the villages. Now, de de the demolitions haven't actually occurred. The village took their case to the Supreme Court, and that's where it's been sleeping ever since. And, perfectly honest with you, it's much better sleeping in the Supreme Court than awake in the Supreme Court. Because ultimately, if it does go to, to a hearing, the Supreme Court could say, yep, they need this land for security, the houses, the villages are going to get demolished. At the moment, it's sleeping, which means that the, the, the villages aren't at risk at the moment of having their villages demolished. The third type of house demolitions is administrative basically means you don't have a permit to build. Now, in many Western democratic countries, you need a permit to build. Why? Because the local authority needs to make sure that your plans match up with their plans and that they can provide you with running water, electricity, sewage, and so on and so forth. But if the basic infrastructure of your neighborhood has barely changed in 47 years, the chances of you getting a permit are minimum. And the local authority will use all sorts of excuses <coughs> not to issue permits in Jerusalem, such as the house is too much on a slope, the house is too close to a road, the house is too close to a settlement, the house is too close to a Jewish school, the house is too close to military infrastructure, we cannot provide the house with running water, electricity, sewage and so on. Palestinians know that the chances of them getting a permit to build, even if they apply for one, is minimum. So the majority of Palestinians build without a permit build without a permit, and then this is what happens. The first document that you receive is a court order where you are invited to come to court and appeal the demolition order on your house. ICAD is not aware of a single demolition order that has been overturned because of an appeal. The second document that you receive is the demolition order itself. And what it says on this document is, demolish your home or we'll demolish it for you. There's no date on this demolition. It doesn't say when it's going to happen. It could happen 10 days later, 10 weeks later, 10 months later, 10 years later, or even never. But from the moment that that family have a house demolition order in their hand, they're living in a place of fear. 
They're waking up every morning and the first thing they're doing is checking to see if their bulldozer is outside their home. When you cause an entire population of people to live in a place of fear, that's state terrorism. And that's exactly what house demolitions are. It's state terrorism. Because when you demolish a home, you affect the entire community around that house. Now, on the day of the demolition, it, because of the because of the system in Israel, you have the Ministry of Interior, the local authority of Jerusalem, the civil administration. So depending on which area you in, depends under whose rule you are, depends which security uh, services are going to pitch up on the day of the demolition. So it will either be the police and border police or the army and the border police. They will either come between 1 and 4 o'clock in the morning when they know everyone is half asleep and dozy, or they'll come in the middle of the afternoon, in the middle of the day, when they know it's only the women and children at home. More often than not, the family will resist their demolition, the house demolition. So they use tear gas and stun grenades <coughs> to get the family out of the house. Then a private contractor will go in and remove the belongings from within the house. And then the same contractor or another private contractor will demolish the home. At the end of the demolition, the family are handed a bill and they have to pay for the cleanup and for the demolition. If the family decide to self-demolish, meaning they don't wait until... Can I just come in a bit? If the family decide to self-demolish and they, instead of waiting for the authorities to do it, it means that they're a little bit in control <laughs> in how it happens and when it happens. And it gives them time to take out their belongings. If they self-demolish, it means you're a little bit more in control. And it's always going to be cheaper to self-demolish than wait for the authorities to do it for you. What a horrible situation to find yourself in. I don't think any of us can imagine what it must be like to wake up in the morning and see bulldozers outside your house, knowing they're going to demolish your home. If you can emotionally stand it, there are videos on YouTube where you can see a house demolition. It's incredibly traumatic. You see higher rates of drug abuse, alcohol abuse, and domestic abuse among families who've had their houses demolished. Palestinian women become incredibly disorientated after a demolition. The effect on children is devastating. In fact, there is a professor in Gaza who did research on suicide bombers and found that over 50% had had their houses demolished as children. Now, the reason this building is still standing, why it's still looking like this, this, is, this was demolished about eight or nine years ago now. It's quite a long time that it's been here. And the reason is, is because the man who built the, this building was building apartment blocks for young Palestinian couples. They hadn't actually moved in when it was demolished, but they had paid for apartments in the building. Basically, they had a demolition order on the building, and prior to the demolition order, they signed the, they signed the, biz, the building as a business. They registered it as a business. <coughs> and after the demolition, the owner of the building claimed bankruptcy. And so he wasn't forced to pay for the demolition or the cleanup, which is basically why it still looks like this, because no, there's nobody to clean it up or to pay for the cleanup. We also think they leave it here as a sort of reminder to the community exactly who's in charge. Now I'm going to read you a quote from Emil Cheshin. Emil Cheshin was the long-serving advisor on Arab affairs under two Jerusalem mayors. This quote is from 1999. Nothing has changed. I'm going to read it as though it's the present tense. And this is what he says about development and planning in Jerusalem. Israel turned urban planning into a tool of the government to be used to help prevent the expansion of the city's non-Jewish population. It is a ruthless policy, if only for the fact that the needs, to say nothing of the rights, of Palestinians are ignored. Israel saw the adoption of strict zoning plans, green zones, as a way of limiting the number of new homes built in Palestinian neighborhoods and thereby ensuring that the Palestinian percentage of the city's population, which was 30% in 1967, did not grow beyond this level, 
Allowing too many new homes in Palestinian neighborhoods would mean too many Palestinian residents in the city. The idea is to move as many Jews as possible into East Jerusalem and move as many Palestinians as possible out of the city entirely. Israeli housing policy in East Jerusalem was and is all about this numbers game. Okay guys, back on the bus, we're gonna head up to